Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions, and thank you again so much for our time together. I'm Pastor Summerall, the pastor of the Cathedral of Praise, and I am looking forward to seeing you in services this weekend. We are now officially at 30% capacity in all four locations. Well, and then Bulacan and Pampanga are at 50%, so forgive me if I'm envious of them, but I'm looking forward to seeing you in services this weekend. Now, we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, but remember, safety, prudence, but we need to be in God's house. All right, let's open up our hearts for the reading of Psalms 91, our foundational passage in this time. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91. As we go to prayer today... I want you to remember that exiting this COVID-19 thing is not going to happen overnight. I know we're all very happy that things are loosening up. Travel has been reannounced, though I'm not sure anybody wants to travel right now. Uh, we're beginning to see loosening between the borders of the provinces. The malls are beginning to function. Restaurants are going to start functioning. So things are starting to look a little better, even though they said no Christmas parties. But this is not over yet. And beloved, I would just encourage you in Jesus' name. Safety, prudence, wisdom, but be in God's house. Now, let's, let's talk for a minute about exiting this thing. Do you remember each year when we fast, I tell you, exiting a fast takes just as much wisdom as discipline as entering a fast. Before you enter a fast, you cut out the caffeine three, to week, three days to a week ahead you cut out the sugar three days to a week ahead. Uh, exiting the fast takes wisdom and discipline also. It, it requires that you don't go out and gorge yourself, you know, on a pizza as you break a 10-day fast or something. You're going to get sick. In the same way, life has been <laughs> withdrawn from. And this is going to take a little getting used to to begin to re-engage. The young people and the seniors that have been locked down the longest, it's going to seem a little odd. and You're going to feel some insecurity getting out and among people because you've been like in your little, your nest, all right? It's, it's, like, it's like eaglets coming out of their nest. There's going to be a little insecurity, but you're going to be fine. But also, let's not go crazy, okay? Let's keep the mask on. Let's keep the shield on. Let's keep the alcohol on the hands going. Let's keep our little bottles of alcohol with us. Let's be careful with our social distancing. This thing's not over yet. So as the government begins to loosen things up a little bit, you know, they can't loosen up your personal discipline. You need to maintain your personal discipline. Father, as we come to you in prayer today, we are so grateful. This has been a long journey without church for so many of our people. And Father, for some, they haven't stayed with devotions, they haven't availed of the evening services, and their hearts have started to grow cold. They've started to, to pull back. Father, I ask in this season, as things begin to reopen, I ask for a special outpouring of grace, a special outpouring of mercy upon the people of God. But Father, for those whose hearts have grown a little cold, Father, let their hearts begin to burn again. 
Make your presence real to them, Father. Let the Holy Spirit bring to their remembrance verses that they've heard. Let them hear a song that triggers a memory. Let them hear something that triggers a memory of your presence. Oh, Father, by your Spirit, work deep within the hearts, especially of the young people and the seniors that have been locked up so long. Father, in Jesus' name, let something trigger the memories of your presence, the joy of being in your presence, the emotions of being in your presence. Father, I ask in Jesus' name, for your namesake and for the sake of your great people, touch hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for our people as they begin to re-engage. Many have not yet, Lord, but as the young people and as the seniors begin to re-engage, Father, let their hearts be calm and quiet within them. Let there be no fear controlling their life and controlling their decisions. Let there be a calm, simple rest of faith as they move back into their life and begin to engage in life again and begin to live the abundant life that you've called them to live. Father, I pray for all the frontliners today. Again, Lord, their life has not gotten any easier. Let your strength be in them. Strengthen them in their inner being by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let their emotions, let their will, let their thoughts and attitudes, let all of their inner being be strengthened. Let their physical bodies be strengthened, Father, and fill them with joy. Fill them with joy. Let them see miracles, Lord, as they lay those gloved ppe hands upon the sick. Let them see miracles in their hospitals, Father. Let them see the reality of God. Father, there are many of our businesses. I ask for restoration. You are the God who restores fortunes. You restore us to full health. You restore the comfort to our souls. But Lord, we ask that you restore the fortunes of your people. Lord, restore that entire lifestyle back to your people, double in Jesus' name. I thank you now for it, Father. And Lord, I come to you. And I ask that you begin to fill your house again. Draw your people unto yourself, Father. Draw your people unto yourself. Whatever attitudes have developed, whatever coldness has developed, let all that be washed away by just a touch of the Holy Ghost. Draw your people back into your house again, Lord, for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Our New Testament passage today picks up where we left off yesterday in Titus chapter 2. Now, Titus 2, that first part, took a long time yesterday, but there was such incredibly important truth there. Our passage is a little shorter today, so we'll definitely get ourselves into Jeremiah. Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, this is, this is a tremendous leadership letter. He said, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all all people. There's not not just a few saved. So this is not Calvinism. 
You hear a lot about Calvinism in our country now because of all the, the internet stuff. Calvinism basically says only the elect are saved. But grace appeared to bring salvation to all people. Salvation is potentially available for everybody. Training us. Ah, so salv grace. Let's just make a list here. Grace, number one, brings salvation. Grace, number two, trains us. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now, that is a mouthful. So, grace is a teacher. Grace teaches us to renounce. Now, now, that's a big word. It doesn't just say, you know, not participate. It says renounce ungodliness, renounce worldly passion. Again, it doesn't say just not participate. It said renounce these things. These are things you are to renounce. That is not who I am. Like when you renounce your faith or you renounce a claim on something. It, it's a strong word. You, This is not a part of my life. So grace doesn't teach you to live in sin. Grace teaches you to renounce sin and worldly passions. And grace teaches us to live self-controlled. That's beautiful. Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. So five things that grace teaches us in this present age. This isn't for eternity to come. This is right now. Grace is the greatest teacher in our life to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Grace teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Like I said, that's a mouthful. In this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, that is the rapture. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, if there was ever a time we should be looking for the rapture. I don't know when it will come. But as you see things changing in the world, I mean, you know, there's just stuff that you see. There's no, there's no signs of the rapture in the Bible, but there's signs of the end times. You know, like China will march against Western Europe and the Antichrist army, joining with the armies of Africa at the Valley of Armageddon to fight the Antichrist. And they cross a dried up, dried up riverbed, the Euphrates riverbed. Well, you know, a few years ago, they put a new dam in the Euphrates, and now with the push of a button, they can dry up the Euphrates River. Amazing. You, you see right now all of the talk about abolishing hard currency in the world because of COVID. So we're going to get rid of hard currencies. Well, that means the government knows every single thing that you do with your money. Every single thing you do, every place you go is easily tracked because there's no paper money. There's no anonymity anymore. There's no, there's no freedom of paper money. It has to be set up for the Antichrist. Because remember, no buying or selling without the mark of the beast on either your, your forehead or, or the back of your hand. Now, you know, there's things being set up in this world that are just amazing. I'm looking forward to the rapture every day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, again, big mouthful, okay? Who gave himself for us to redeem us. We have been redeemed from all lawlessness, bought back from it. We don't, we don't live in sin. We've been redeemed from it. Purify for himself. He purified us with his blood. And we've been purified to be a people of his own possession. We belong to him. <laughs> we don't belong to this world. We belong to him. And we are zealous for good works. Now, now this, this is the great effect. That This is what he expects to see. He expects to see this attitude. We should be zealous for good works. This, this is something that, that we are very much excited about being a part of. He said, declare these things. All right, Timothy, what do you preach about? Or Titus, rather. What to preach about? 
these things, okay? Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Wow. Now, now brothers and sisters, I, I don't like some of this because I, I like to say things nicely to people. But you know what? Sometimes the role of a pastor is not just to exhort or encourage you. Sometimes it's to rebuke. You know, people want to go around and teach funny things. People want to go around and live funny ways that aren't biblical. My job as, as pastor is not to be popular. Titus, re, exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. People are supposed to pay attention to their pastor, not to every little voice that comes along. Chapter 3. Forgot to turn it on. I always forget on the New Testament part. Have you noticed? Then I get back into it properly in the Old Testament part. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them. All right, so here's the role of a pastor. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. All right, so reminders. We have one. We have two. We have three. We have four. We have five. Five reminders. That's something that I am, these are five things I'm to remind people of. And then he continues, to speak evil of no one, six, to avoid quarreling, seven, to be gentle, eight, to show perfect courtesy toward all people, nine. Okay, these are now nine reminders. Wow, nine reminders. Timothy, speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling. To be gentle. To show perfect courtesy toward all people. He said, why? For we ourselves were once, okay, that was then, this is now. We were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to very passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy. Malice means to do things to hurt people. That's just how we lived. Passing our days in malice, envy, hated by others, and hating one another. He said, ah, this was then This was then, this is now. So that, that's how we used to live. He said, but what changed us? He said, but when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior, God our Savior appeared. <laughs> what saved us? The goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared to us. Not just in the world, but to us. He saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. How did he save us? Mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewal of the Holy Spirit. All right, how he saved us. Beautiful. Whom he poured out on us richly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, poured out on us richly. All right, take a truth here. Outpouring of Holy Spirit is never with an eyedropper. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our life is never in little bits. It pours out on us richly. So that, we always circle so that, being justified by his grace, we might become his heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're going to get more into that tonight. So I won't, I'll leave that for later. That's beautiful though. Justified by his grace. We might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. All right, here are these trustworthies. You need to make lists of those trustworthy sayings. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. He said, all right, now, Timothy, this is a trustworthy saying. This whole concept of salvation here. He said, and I want you to insist on these things, all of these things that we've been talking about above. All right, all of these things. So that... Those who have believed in God 
may be careful to devote themselves to good works. He said, now listen, you, you gotta, you got to push all of this, Timothy. If you want the people to serve, these are the things you have to teach. All right, so people say, how do you get a congregation motivated to serve? Well, you don't go around and sip, sip and do motivational talks. This is how to motivate service. This is how you motivate service. You teach. You insist on, wow, you insist on these things. You teach them and insist on these things. This is what motivates people to work. You, you, you insist on all this beautiful submission to authorities, uh, the reminders of how we're supposed to live, uh, the effect of grace upon our lives, what Jesus has done in our lives, what grace has done in our lives. You, you insist on these things. This is what motivates people to serve. He said, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Now, we've talked about this several times, all right? There are things that Timothy, as a pastor, you just avoid. You, you stay away from this stuff. He said, as for a person who stirs up division. Now, I want you to notice. People stir up division. Division does not exist in the body. We are united by the Holy Spirit. But there are people, and notice it is a person. As for a person. Didn't say a group, a person. Every time you find division in church, every time you find division among the people of God, there's a person driving it. And they're stirring it up. They're calling people. They're motivating their friends to call people. There's always a person behind it. After warning him once and then twice, he says, you know what? Have nothing more to do with him. Now, that's how the church should handle a person of division. First, a person who wants to stir up division you just have nothing more to do with them. Just, just ignore them. You don't go to their Facebook anymore. You don't go to their Twitter page anymore. You don't go to their Instagram anymore. You just have nothing to do with them. Knowing. Now, this is something that you know. Knowing that such a person, now notice again, it's always a person. Behind every division, there's a person. That such a person is warped, Sinful and self-condemned. You, you start digging around in your life and you're going to find they've got warped attitudes. Now, warped is like a, a board that got wet and then it kind of twisted. It's not straight anymore. Their theology is a little twisted. Their attitudes are a little twisted. Their, 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 their life is a little twisted, you know? They're warped. They're sinful. Dig around and you'll find a bunch of sin there. Dig around and you'll see that they live under guilt. They're self-condemned. Not condemned by God, self-condemned. They live under this horrible thing of guilt. There's something going on in their lives. This is why they want to divide people and point everybody at everybody else. Because there's something going on in their life that they don't want anybody to notice. He said, when I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best. Now, we've talked about this several times already. Do your best. Paul never asked people to do what they couldn't do. Do your best. You know, and, and I think that's something that we have to learn in Christianity. Everybody's best is different. Everybody's best is different. If I do my best to sing, <laughs> well, you know, my best isn't my best isn't very good. Pastor Manalo does his best to sing. It's a different story. So do your best has to deal more with your own abilities and your own situation. Every time you serve God, you should do your best. Now, your best may be off the charts because you have tremendous opportunities, tremendous abilities, etc. Or your best may not be very much in everybody else's sight because you have limited abilities and limiting circumstances. But you know what? In God's sight, your best, your best is always good enough. Your best is always perfect. And, and you just need to get a hold of that. 
pen problems. My pen is not doing its best. Your best is always perfect in God's sight. Just make sure you do your best. You know, sometimes I see the Lolas singing in the choir. And please forgive me, their voices are not what they were when they were in their 20s and 30s, but they're doing their best. And it is the most beautiful melody in the ears of God. Everybody just needs to do their best. This is a great truth that you just got to get a hold of in life. And Paul never expected anybody to do what they couldn't do. Paul only asked people to do your best. Do your best to come to be at Nicopolis. Now, remember, where is Nicopolis? It's right there just before Philippi. It's the new city right there on the Aegean Sea. For I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best. Here's that. Do your best again. To speed, Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. All right. So uh, meet the needs. When we are trying to help uh, Pastor Dag or somebody do crusades or T.L. Osborne years ago, we, we wanted to see that they lack nothing. We wanted to make sure that everything that they need to do a crusade with is taken care of. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful, all right? So learning, this is something to learn. You have to learn to serve. It doesn't come automatically. Just like everything else in Christianity, there's learned behavior. You have to learn to devote themselves to good works. Why? So as to help cases of urgent need. You know, sometimes urgent things come along and if people aren't already trained to help, they're not ready and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Ah, people loved Paul in the faith. He's talking about his faith family. Grace be to all of you. Now, now again, there's some amazing stuff in here. You just got to go take your time and work through it. Amazing truth about living the Christian life inside of a local church. This, this is how it works. He's, he's writing to the pastor of a local church. Amazing truth. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship.
for your sake we face death all day long. Though in all these things we are more than Testament passage today picks up in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 1. Have you noticed I always remember to click on the reading portion with the Old Testament and the New Testament portion? Every morning I seem to forget. But we'll click it on now. When Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, which, which the Lord their God had sent him to them. All right, so God sent. So this is God sent. Azariah, son of Hashaiah, and Jananan, the son of Kiriah, and all the insolent men, wow, said to Jeremiah, You are telling a lie. The Lord our God did not send you to say, Do not go to Egypt to live there. Wow. <laughs> um, what pastor's face? Insolent men. You know what? Sometimes there are just insolent people <laughs> in the church. And you, 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 sh you share with them the word of God, and they just yell at you for it. Okay. Young pastors, these are things, they're not new to you. So young pastors who are listening to me, young Bible school students listening to me, young connect group leaders listening to me, <laughs> insolent people are part of life. So just... Deal with it, all right? Move on. Don't, don't stop what God is asking you to do. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, has sent you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, all right? So that they may kill us or take us into exile in Babylon. Wow. So they thought man sent. They thought man sent, but he was God sent. So Jonanon, the son of Kariah, and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. They disobeyed. But Jonanon, the son of Kariah, and all the commanders of the forces took all the remnant of Judah who had returned to live in the land of Judah from all the nations to which they had been driven, the men, the women, the children, the princesses, and every person whom Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, had left with Jedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shahan, also Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch, son of Neriah. And they came to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the Lord. And they arrived at Tafanes. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in Tafanes. Take in your hand large stones and hide them in the mortar in the pavement that is at the entrance to Pharaoh's palace in Tafanes, in the sight of the men of Judah, and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and I will set his throne above these thrones that I have hidden, and he will spread his royal canopy over them. 
He shall come and strike the land of Egypt, giving over, giving over to pestilence those who are doomed to pestilence, to captivity those who are doomed to captivity, and to the sword those who are doomed by the sword. And I will kindle a fire in the temples of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captive. And he shall clean the land of Egypt as a shepherd cleans his cloak of vermin, and he shall go away from there in peace. In other words, total victory, folks. He shall break the obelisk of Heropolis, which is in the land of Egypt, and the temples of the gods he shall burn with fire. Chapter 44, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Judeans who lived in the land of Egypt, at Migdal, at Pathanes, at Memphis, and in the land of Pathos. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have seen all the disaster that I brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities. Behold, this day they are in desolation and no one lives in them. Because of the evil they committed. Okay, it's their fault. Provoking me to anger. All right, so God gets angry. And you know what? People provoke God to anger. You know, have you ever been around people that just provoke people? They just want to make people mad, so they, they provoke them? It's like they keep sticking a, a psychological needle in them until the person just gets angry? There are people like that. They provoke God to anger. Now, it's hard to get God mad. God, God's not like a person. God is slow to anger, but you know what? You keep poking God and you get him angry. In that they went to make offerings and serve other gods that they knew not, neither they, nor you, nor your fathers. He said, you know how people provoke me to anger? They go into these demonic temples and they start making offerings and they start doing things to serve these, these non-existent gods that are nothing but demons. He said, yet persistently, I sent to you. All my servants, the prophets, saying, oh, do not do this abomination that I hate. God kept saying, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Please. Persistently. So they're, <laughs> look at it as the two Ps. They're provoking and God is persistently. They're provoking and God is persistent. They, they provoke God and God persistently says, please, please don't do this. But they did not listen or incline their ear to turn from their evil and make no offerings to other gods. Therefore, my wrath and my anger was poured out and kindled in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they became a waste and a desolation as it is at this day. And now, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves to cut off from you a man, a woman, infant, and child from the midst of Judah, leaving you no remnant? God said, you did this. God will never leave you without a remnant. God said, you, you did this. You took everybody out of the land that I gave you. You left no remnant. He said, this is a great evil. Wow. Why do you provoke me to anger with the words, works of your hands, making offerings to other gods in the land of Egypt, where you have come to live, so that you may be cut off and become a curse and a taunt among all the nations of the earth? All right, so here's the fruit. He said, you, you made a decision to leave the land. I left you there as a remnant. I promised I would leave people there, and I left you there, and you left. He said, now you've become a curse and a taunt among all the nations of the earth. Oh, have you forgotten the evil of your fathers? The evil of the kings of Judah? The evil of their wives? Wow. Evil of the fathers. Evil of the kings. Evil of their wives. Your own evil. The evil of your wives, which they committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. They have not humbled themselves even to this day. Nor have they feared, nor have they walked in my law and my statutes that I set before you, before you and your before your fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel: Behold, I will set my face against you for harm, to cut off all Judah. I will take the remnant of Judah who have set their faces to come to the land of Egypt. This is the remnant that was supposed to stay in the land, but instead they have come to the land of Egypt to live. 
and they shall be consumed in the land by Egypt, and they shall fall. By the sword and by famine they shall be consumed. From the least to the greatest they shall die by the sword and by the famine they shall become an oath, a horror, a curse, and a taunt. I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt as I punish Jerusalem, the sword, famine, and pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah, here's that remnant again, none of the remnant of Judah who have come to live in the land of Egypt shall escape or survive or return to the land of Judah to which they desire to return there. For they shall not return except some fugitives. <laughs> God even leaves a remnant of the remnant. That's mercy. Then all the men who knew that their wives had made offerings to other gods. Wow. And all the women who stood by, a great assembly, and all the people who lived in Pathros and the land of Egypt, answered Jeremiah. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, We will not listen to you. Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what do you do with that? Stubborn, unrepentant hearts. But we will do everything we have vowed. We will make offerings to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we did. Both we, our fathers, our kings, our officials in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and prospered and we saw no disaster. All right. So they choose their God because they think that God has helped them. But since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring our drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have become consumed by the sword and by famine. <laughs> and the women said, when we made offerings to the queen of heaven and poured out our drink offerings to her, was it without our husband's approval that we made cakes for bearing her image and poured our drink offerings to her? And Jeremiah said to all the people, men and women, all the people who had given him this answer, as for the offerings that you offered in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings, your officials, and the people of the land, did not God remember them? Did it not come into his mind? The Lord could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. Therefore, your land has become a desolation, a waste, and a curse without inhabitant, inhabitant as it is this day. It is because you made offerings and because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey the voice of the Lord or walk in his law and his statutes and his testimonies that this disaster has happened to you. Not because you stopped offering to the queen of heaven, but because you were offering to the queen of heaven. Jeremiah said to all the people and all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who are living in the land of Egypt. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, You and your wives have declared with your mouths and have fulfilled it with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have made to make offerings to the Queen of Heaven and pour out our drink offerings to her. Then confirm your vows and perform your vows. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no longer be invoked by the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, as the Lord lives. God said, you can't use my name anymore. <laughs> you, can't use, you, you can't call upon my name anymore. Behold, I'm watching over them for disaster and not for good. All the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword or by famine until there's an end of that. And those who escape the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, few in number. And all the remnant of Judah who came to the land of Egypt to live shall know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. Wow. God said, we'll see whose word stands. You say, I'm going to do my vow. I said I was going to do this and I'm going to do it. And God said, well, I said I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it. We'll see whose word stands. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, don't have a stubborn contest with God. You're going to lose. <laughs> Please. These people are having a stubborn contest with God. He said, this should be a sign to you, declares the Lord, that I will punish you in this place in order that you may know that my words will surely stand. My words will surely stand. 
against you for harm. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh, Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of those who seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who was his enemy and sought his life. Chapter 45, verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch the son of Neriah when he wrote these words in the book at the dictation of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. You said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with groaning, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, What I have built, I am breaking down. What I have planted, I am plucking up. That is the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all the places that you shall go. So Baruch, you're not going to die in the middle of all of this suffering, pestilence, disease, war, conquering armies. He said, Baruch, I give you your life as a prize of war. Now, brothers and sisters, I guess this kind of really sums up a lot of a lot of the book of Jeremiah. The stubborn hearts of God's people having a stubborn contest with God. Beloved, please never do this. Please. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is forgiving. Just turn from your sinful ways. And turn to him, and he will forgive, and he will heal, and he will bless you. All right, we'll see you tonight. Service preaching on the sons of God out of Romans chapter 8. See you then, 7 o'clock.